And welcome everybody to the California Commission on the Status of Women and Girls second training for our grant funding opportunity. Um, we have uh, an hour set scheduled for today, but before we get going, um, I want to offer that we do have closed captioning available for anybody who needs subtitles. Um, go to your more button and click on live transcript. I'm also going to have everybody on mute until we get to the open Q&A section of this training. So I am going to, um, I still see people in the waiting room joining our call. So give us one more minute and we will jump into the training. Okay, well, so thank you again for joining. If you are joining and new, please, it, we have closed captioning available. If you'd like to have that option, click on live transcript for anybody who needs that assistance. Um, we are uh, have an hour dedicated to the Q&A session. Uh, we are not going to go over in great detail as we did at our last training each section of the application, but we're going to highlight some elements of the application and its submission process, as well as um, feature some of the questions and answers that have come in and dedicate majority of the time to you all to please um, ask your questions. Um, we are taking questions two ways. Um, throughout this call, you can submit it through the chat feature. Um, you can also use your raise your hand feature when we get to that point and we will answer your questions. Um, I'd like to take a moment to also um, welcome members of our team, um, most notably Darcy Totten, who is our communications director here. Darcy, you want to introduce yourself? Hey, everybody. Nice to meet you. Um, Holly, I think we might need to do a mute one more time for folks who have come in at the end. Um, I am <laughs> everybody but me. <laughs> yeah, I unmuted you. Sorry. Uh, um, I, I am the director of communications at the commission. I'm also who is uh, getting a lot of your questions via email and possibly writing back to you. So nice to nice to meet you all. And here's the face you can put with those emails. And I should have taken a moment to also introduce myself. I'm Holly Martinez, the executive director of the commission, also working with many of you on the questions that have been coming in. Um, I will say we re have received um, quite a few applications already. Some of you who may have um, submitted incorrectly or have had formatting issues or um, only submitted one cost sheet instead of two, we have been kicking them back to you for the opportunity to make those revisions before the deadline. So I hope that is um, helpful to you all. Um, the questions coming in, we are trying to be as responsive as possible. Um, so again, grants at women.ca.gov is another form for where you can ask your questions and we are trying to be as responsive as possible. Um, so going into it, I'm actually going to kick it over now to Darcy to walk you all through a little bit of the formatting and submission pointers um, to share as we have been seeing some of these applications come in through and want to reinforce some pieces of it. Thanks, Holly. Hi, everybody. Um, all right, I'm going to try to share my screen here. No laughing at my 10,000 tabs. <laughs> All right, so when you, can everybody see this okay, Holly? Sorry, thumbs up, okay. So when you get to uh, our page for grant applications, the page should look like this, and you'll wanna scroll down and hit this button to download the grant application. So we know that some people are having a hard time downloading the application. This, as far as we can tell, seems to be uh, about individual computers. Some folks have plug-in blockers, some folks, different browser helps. So if you are struggling to get it downloaded, try opening it in another browser, Chrome or Internet Explorer. Um, also try refreshing or even uh, clearing out your cache. Uh, that seems to have worked for most people. If you are still having a hard time, you can email me. Uh, I, will, I will be the person on the other end of that grants at women.ca.gov email address that is on that page that you can click and email and just let me know you've tried those things and you're still having a hard time and we will figure out a way uh, to help you submit. So 
no worries. We are not going to let any technical glitches interfere with your ability to submit your application. But please try those things first. Uh, so you're going to go through, you'll download this application form. And what you're going to get is a form that is, a, it's a Word document form. It has text boxes. It is really important that when you reply um, that you fill out that form using those text boxes. They should expand. Again, there might be some differences if you're struggling there. One of the things that we have heard from folks is um, just a, a note for that. Quick keys don't work. So you're not going to want to use your quick keys to copy and paste from somewhere else. You're going to want to use your mouse right click. That will help a lot. Uh, once your application is ready, and if you need any help along the way from the last technical assistance training, there is the last recording is here as well as presentation slides and the transcript from the last time and we'll have uh, this recording up as well. But once you're ready to submit, you're going to scroll down a little bit and the submission form is right here. We did our best to make this really easy. So this is the only form part that you need to fill out. You're going to want to check every box that you are applying for and then just drag your completed application here and hit submit and it's going to come to me. Uh, we'll take a look at it. We'll make sure that everything's formatted, that it came through. If it didn't, we'll kick it back to you before the deadline. Unfortunately, we can't do that after the deadline. So if you're worried about it, get it in early um, and we'll let you know that we got it. And then if you need some additional information, uh, this page is sort of our clearinghouse for anything you might possibly need, including some social media toolkits if you wanna help spread the word in your community about this opportunity. Uh, we've also got a public survey that we'd really like to encourage everyone to take. It is available in five different languages. It's a short, easy Google Docs style survey that you can take just by clicking here. And that helps inform this project as a whole, letting us know more about what your community is really struggling with under COVID. Uh, we've got some information specifically on local commissions. If you're not sure how to reach out to yours, listings and contact information. Also, if you are one of the people who is interested in starting a local commission and applying for grant funds to do so, we've got a pretty stellar handbook that was made by the National Association on Women's Commissions that's available here for download. And then this little map shows you where the current county commissions are. Yes, I promise San Francisco is there. It's just a really tiny little dot. Um, the city commissions are for the most part housed within counties that also have commissions. Uh, but if you happen to know that we've missed one, please feel free, reach out, let us know. We'll add it to the map. And then if you go a little further down, you get all of the FAQs. So chances are, if you've got a question that we don't hit today, it might already be in here. So please take a look through this. And at the very bottom of our many, many FAQs is the review process, including uh, sort of how everything will be scored as well as the rubric for scoring. So you can take a, a good look at how we're gonna be judging those and use that to put together your grant application. And I think that's everything for this page. I'm gonna kick it back to Holly here. Thank you, Darcy. Okay, so before we go into the q and I wanted to highlight a few questions that seem to um, be repeating uh, of themselves and where we have found some hiccups. Um, first, um, I want to reinforce that yes, you can apply for multiple categories of funding um, in your one singular proposal. Um, you will need to write, uh, produce a cost sheet for every funding category you're requesting. So again, if you are um, requesting funds for both capacity building and communications, you will submit one proposal. You will have two cost sheets for the communications um, budget and for the capacity building budget. And no, you do not need to write multiple budget narratives. There is one box and one question for a budget narrative, and that is a place where you should cover as much of um, that uh, area for all categories that you're requesting funds. Um, I do want to reinforce um, some eligibility questions that have come up. Um, Again, if you go to the application, we itemize the eligibility um, for government entities, be it city or county governments, women's commissions established with cities or counties. Um, we are also uh, opening this up to nonprofit 
organizations that are registered 501c3 status, C6 status, or C19. That question came up in the last meeting and we have responded to folks who've asked that specifically, but I wanna clarify that for everybody on the call and anybody else who might be watching this at a later point. Um, we do um, need, as you will get, if you get the funding, we will be asking for some eligibility slash verification documents. So for example, if you are a nonprofit, um, you will likely be asked to verify your status, whether it be with the Secretary of State's office or IRS forms that will be required at a later point. Um, but that might also help provide some clarity on whether or not you are eligible. Um, under the section where we're asking for you to provide a list of grants that you've received in the past, I would like to clarify it's for the past five years for any grant, be it private, public, um, federal, state, local, um, we'd like to know within the last five years uh, what those grants have looked like, what they have been, who, have they, been, who, have, who they have been from. In the scoring rubric, I also want to clarify um, previous iterations of what we had online did show a word count um, within the scoring rubric. That was a typo and has been removed. So please do not um, worry or refer to word counts listed in the scoring rubric, but only the word count listings within the actual proposal and the funding categories. Um, that have that specific direction on your word count. And then finally, um, uh, while the scoring rubric um, is a sample of how we are going to be scoring and evaluating your proposal, um, the questions and considerations in there was provided in advance so that you it would help you as you develop your proposal. You may not see in the proposal section itself um, specific language that matches up verbatim, but it is for your consideration to think about as you develop and write your proposal. So those were some of the um, trending items I had seen where I saw a lot of questions come in. Um, but with that, I am going to let this uh, session be for you and would like anybody to ask any remaining questions they have. Again, to reinforce this, you can do this two ways. One, type it in the chat. Darcy, I'll ask you to call out those questions. Um, once we get through those, if there's still some remaining questions, uh, raise your hand and we will call on you and you can ask your question. So with that, Darcy, do you wanna go ahead and uh, call yeah. out the uh, questions? So the first one is a question about whether or not multiple budget narratives should be included for each cost sheet. No, one single budget narrative in your proposal should cover all of the cost sheets that you're submitting individually. Um, we also have a request on that to sort of walk through the cost sheet or just articulate a little bit more. Is that something you have a minute with, Holly? Sure. Why don't we keep answering questions and then I'll pull up the cost sheet to do a screen share here in a few minutes. That works. Sounds good. Okay. Uh, so another one is, uh, is it necessary uh, to have been grant funded in the past, given that some of these organizations have been funded by donor gifts? Um, if, if the question is trying to ask whether or not, um, they have no grant funding history for the past five years. Okay. That is not a requirement. Um, you're not ineligible if you have not received grant funding in the last five years, we're trying to understand if you have, what have been your funding sources. Um, I do understand also sometimes donor advised funds keep funders anonymous. So therefore it is hard at times to, um, display that information or share it, but it is not a requirement. It does not make you ineligible if you have not received that funding in the last five years. Excellent. Um, I'm not able to also write down your answer. So Holly, we're gonna have to go through these again, but we will put some of these up in the FAQ for afterwards. Uh, so with regards to grant funds being rolled over if they are not spent in the program year, is that something that is possible? At this time, it is not something we can offer. Um, the funding is specifically tied to state funds um, that do expire by fiscal years. So we are receiving funds 
for this fiscal year, 22-23. So the grant terms of having the remaining um, funds expended by the end of February in 2023 is the deadline um, for which you will need to expend all of your funds. Um, should that change, um, it, which would need to be made possible um, through the Department of Finance, um, we will certainly share that. But at this time, you should plan for expending your full funds and not having the rollover option after the grant period. Excellent. Um, let's see. Does this have to be a new program or can it be an old program applying for funding or an existing program? It can be an existing program. It can be an expansion of your existing program. It can be a new program that has been um, uh, considered for your agency or entity, but have not had the funds to, to launch and um, you know make available. So it can be um, any of those options. Fantastic. Uh, and another one we get a lot are, can these funds be used for new positions or salary? It can, yes. And I would recommend that for the budget cost sheet, you I identify um, in your narrative and your budget cost sheet um, where those positions and what percentage and cost of funding will be dedicated to that. And Darcy, I have the cost sheet up here so I can walk through it now. Great, let's do that. Okay. Darcy, thumbs up, you can see this, Kashi? Yep. Great. Mm -hmm. um, so this is the very last page of the application. You will see here, this is the application. It ends with the timeline and then the final document is the cost sheet. Um, we, were, we are asking you to fill out your organization's name, the title of your proposal, and then to click on which category this budget template um, cost sheet is covering. So again, if this is for capacity building and you wrote above your capacity building proposal, click on the capacity building box. You see it, it marks it. And then you write your budget specific uh, for the resources you're needing to produce and support your proposed activities. Um, so budget category personnel, this is where you can list. Um, say, for example, you want a project manager, um, that you want to cover part of their salary. Um, you can list that, you know, project manager, um, you know, total, I don't know, $15,000. These are all examples. Um, please don't use this in your proposal. It doesn't wait in any way, my examples. Um, you can also insert rows. So if I want to have um, a row, because I want to have several people under this budget, please do so. Um, you know, I, we're asking everybody to use a template. That does not mean you can't expand um, and increase rows um, according to the proposed budget. The next category is operational expenses. This is where I would see any hard costs, supplies, materials. For example, say you are um, proposing to host an event and a hard cost would be, um, you know, event related supplies. Um, you want to create and distribute collateral materials that help educate the public about, you know, an effort that you are doing. That's where you would itemize those expenses. And then the final um, area is regranting, and this is specifically dedicated for those organizations that click the regranting section of the proposal where you plan to distribute funds and disperse money to other um, grantees. So you will have sub grantees because you are giving out, um, and I would list here, you know, uh, a description, um, even if it hasn't been determined yet, sub grants to organizations offering domestic violence shelter uh, opportunities or, or job training efforts. So if you have affiliates or organizations that you work with regularly through your your existing programming, and you want to subgrant out a money. I would money from this grant. I would itemize it here, and list the amounts or the anticipated amounts that you plan to do. Your project total will come up here in this project total. Um, you will click whether or not you have an indirect cost rate. You are applying to this grant. Um, indirect cost rates should not exceed ten percent. 
Um, if you have a higher negotiated one with the state of California, please submit that documentation and have that rate reflected here. And your grand total of the total budget project and the um, indirect cost rate will be reflected here in this yellow highlighted section. And with that, I'll stop sharing and kick it back to you, Darcy. Thank you. Um, we're, you guys are going real fast for me in the chat here. So trying to keep up and then also read. Um, I might uh, grab Tiffany here shortly to help me out with some of these as they're coming in. There seem to be lots of questions about allowable expenses. So let's actually just take a minute and go over those in, in general, um, specifically around, you know, can line items be modified? Is there a list of allowable expenses? What counts as a consultant, et cetera, et cetera? Um, great. So I will first stop, start off to say, we once you have submitted your application, if you're being considered for funding, we will go over your budget and your proposed activities in greater detail as we finalize your award. So as we had mentioned previously, and as it stated, you know, we will be having um, phone conversations slash interviews to finalize your award. Um, we will go over the activities in detail and provide um, further direction on allowable, reimbursable expenses that are associated with this grant. Um, I know, Tiffany, you have spent some time um, on this, and Tiffany Bartow is our program director. Thank you for joining us, Tiffany. Um, if there's any specific guidance you want to emphasize here, please do so, um, and I'll let you take it. Thank you, Holly. Um, you guys, it looks like I'm going to have to update our FAQ, but it looks like for some of those costs, I think Holly has mentioned this before on the personnel, um, and what you're spending, you know, as far as um, supplies that you need to get your com commission going. Um, those are all considered direct costs. And I will get an updated sheet with kind of like a list of, of um, items that are acceptable under that allowable expenses. Um, so that way you, we can clear up some of those questions that you guys may have that we use for your operations um, generally. So that's kind of the, the basics of what we're looking for on what your um, allowable expenses are. Um, and I would say to go ahead and submit what you guys think you would be spending on for operational, and we can go to that list, um, and I can chew that up in our FAQ um, for everyone to take a look at if that's exactly what you're spending for those operational costs to support local and regional commissions. Um, I think, Holly, one question that did come up a couple, quite a few times um, that we should probably address now is that some people are in the process of getting their 501 status. You know, I'm, I'm currently that's the question. I'm currently applying for it. Will this make it to be the cutoff? I think we should address that question because it's coming up quite a lot right now. Pending approval, can we still apply and are we eligible? Yeah, good question. Um, I know that has come in through the grants email as well on a number of occasions. Unfortunately, at the time of this opportunity, you do need to be a registered 501c nonprofit that is um, registered. Um, at the time of application. Um, therefore, if you're in the process of waiting for your status, you are not eligible to apply. Um, I will say that, as we had mentioned previously, this is a rolling grant opportunity. This is one of what could be potentially future grants that we're offering as part of this effort. So it, there is a possibility that you get your eligibility and we offer a new grant opportunity and you can apply for it. I also know that some organizations um, have been working with fiscal agencies or entities to apply on their behalf. Um, so they are the legal applicant as the fiscal agent applying for the funds on behalf of such and such organization. Um, so those are some of the uh, you know, solutions or opportunities that we are seeing come through. Um, but yes, that is the clarification on that. Thank you. And I just want to uh, true up one more thing, you guys, as I update the FAQ for direct costs. I think we sh you should all be really paying attention to what you're looking at as far as your service activities um, and making that be very plain on what you're spending on your services. And so once we get to take a look at um, what you've turned in, then we'll be able to um, make a more informed decision um, on what you're spending that on. Um, I also will provide, as I go through this, 
a list of things that may not be considered allowable. So um, I think Holly went ahead and mentioned that on, on salaries and staff. Yes, um, that's okay. But um, some things, some people may have promotional items, like food and refreshments and so forth, um, are going to be items that are not going to be allowable. So I will make sure that I put that and update that in the FAQ for you as well. So you guys can continue to um, ask those questions and I can go ahead and jump in the chat. Um, let me, actually, Tiffany, let me throw a few out that are great yeah. for you. And then a few I can just answer right off okay. the top. We're getting lots of questions about how many years of grant funding, the last five. So we know it's not written specifically in the application. Give us five years of previous grant funding. Um, but if you are a municipality applying, do you need to write in five years of grant funding? The answer is no. <laughs> Right. If you if you if you are a government uh, entity applying, don't worry about that. Um, the other question, Tiffany, for regranting, would K through twelve schools, colleges, or universities be eligible to be sub grantees? Tiffany or Holly? You, you want me to go ahead, Holly. I was just going to say um, it, it depends on the circumstance and how it relates to your proposal. I know it's not a clear yes or no answer. I would say, for example, if you are working with um, getting an after school program um, put into place and you want to give, you know, resources to that local entity to help you know, I'm again making this up, girls flourish in, you know, academic excellence through their after school programming. Um, we'd like to know, are you working with ACEs? Are you working with the school district? Um, is this a outside nonprofit like Champions providing this type of programming? So I think the best recommendation I can give on that particular effort is to identify it in your application write it into your budget narrative and have it reflected in your budget cost sheet. And once again, if you are selected um, at, for funding, we will actually have much deeper conversations about this and provide the right guidance you need to ensure that you are following and in alignment with the state's um, allowable and uh, required funding parameters. Um, one of the questions we had was how to title this application. My only request would be that you do title it and that you match the title of your application to any supplementary materials you also put in so that we don't get, um, you know, sort of oddly, oddly titled things that we don't know for sure go together. So if your organization is, um, you know, girls run, title everything, girls run one, two, three, girls run one, girls run two, girls run, right? Whatever, whatever it is, make sure you're titling it all the same so we can keep all of your submissions together. That's, that's a big one. Darcy, okay. I wanted to add to that question because I think someone has a question on um, serving a whole county or do they need to list specific cities and indicate which one they intend to serve? I'm sorry, I didn't understand that. That's okay. So we've got quite a few people asking about serving, you know, if you intend to serve a whole county, do you need to list the specific cities within that county? Um, or can you just indicate which the county that you intend to serve as a whole? So is it just Sacramento County or do I need to list every single county that I intend to serve? I would I'll clarify. You. <laughs> yeah, please, please write the county um, and you can, you have space to say we are serving the entire county of Sacramento. Um, or if you are within a county, but you are only partially serving it, that's where I think it's really helpful for you to identify which targeted cities this funding will impact. And then you know, I want to add to everyone so you just clear. So when you start sending the applications, we will have to have you know deeper conversations with you because all of this is different and you guys are asking different questions that are specific to you. So it's not like one catch-all that everyone's going to fall into this particular bucket, you know, just communications. And so this all catch-all goes through communication. So we'll have to kind of take a look at your circumstances and how you intend to serve regional and local commissions. And then we'll reach out to you for more, more clarity on that. Um, and also ask for more documents if there's something you need to substantiate what you've placed in there. Absolutely. Uh, we do have one in here from earlier, corporate sponsors for events and programs uh, that have asked for small grant applications online. 
uh, would sponsorships like that need to be included in the last five years of grants? Sort of small sponsorships, say for events or what have you. Um, I I would say technically those are not grants; they're they're sponsorships. So no, you do not need to include those type of sponsorships. Okay, and then yes, five years. Uh, can you be funded in one category and not in another if you apply for multiple categories? Yes, that's definitely um, a potential outcome. If you apply for five and you're competitive in two of them, you might get only two of your proposed items funded. Um, you might get all of them funded, but at a lesser rate. Um, so those options are um, on the table and we'll certainly be in communication with you about, you know, the, the funding categories that you were either successful or not successful in as it came uh, down to the final decisions on your full proposal. Um, there is a question about deciding on funding uh, counties or cities, cities that are maybe applying, like governmental entities applying to start commissions in which there may already be a commission. So if you're a city applying to start a commission in a county that already has one, what would be the recommendation to that applicant about working with their existing local commission? Um, no, great question. I definitely, we are strongly encouraging conversation um, and uh, counsel with an existing local commission if it, there is one already in your area. Um, it is important to uh, build those relationships, um, but it, it is not, um, it is not a, a precursor to not being eligible to applying. So for example, if there is a local commission and a new or entity wants to create one, be it city or uh, likely in the scenario be cities wanting to create commissions where there are already county commissions, um, we are, you know, that just because you consult with your county commission, um, you can still apply. Uh, to start your own commission. It is definitely something where we are encouraging, um, you know, more pathways for interested people and wanting to support women to come to the table um, and grow our coalition of advocates supporting local commissions and the growth of them. But I do think in the overall response to, you know, making sure that we're effective and strategic and coordinated, you know, there, there is this um, value in consulting and understanding what's already there, what the priorities are, what the direction is. And so we do encourage those conversations, be it um, people, uh, counties or cities looking to start up a new commission or nonprofit eligible organizations applying for uh, this funding. Um, to also have that same collaborative conversation with their local commission to understand what is happening in that community. Um, there was a question as well about, uh, Tiffany, sorry, in the chat, I'm not totally sure that's the question. I think let's, well, let's hit that question. Okay. There's a question about can the funding be dispersed as um, emergency funds for clients to an organization. So not necessarily emergency funding for the organization, but dispersed as emergency funding, I believe was the question. And Barbara, thank you, Darcy, because I'm on that question right now. So Barbara, you might want to clear up so we can kind of um, flush this question out for you. So you're asking about emergency funds, but you're having it for clients. And so can you just explain a little bit more for me in the chat and I can answer your question? Um, on emergency funds for your own particular, um, yes, that is acceptable, but you'd have to itemize that. So just send me a note on, on that and we'll get that answered for you. Thank you, Darcy. Um, okay, so there's lots of questions about the total funding available to be dispersed. This is a $5 million grant program that we are able to disperse uh, and all of the sort of limits per category are on the website. 
Uh, there's lots of questions about whether or not we're limiting how many grants will be approved in specific regions and areas. That one comes up a lot. Holly, if you want to take that. You know, there's there's not um, a guiding um, set of criteria in place to say, for example, we will only be funding, um, you know, rural communities or certain geographies or an X amount, for example, one million in capacity building versus four million in regranting. It really depends on the full picture of all the applications that come in the door. Um, to see uh, how are we meeting kind of the growing needs across the state and what is the combination of applications that are going to provide um, as much impact as possible. So no, there is not a set number of applications or set amount by category. Um, it will be at the discretion of the commission based on the um, competitive ranking and the overall picture of what's being um, proposed that will determine the final amount of, of funded applications, uh, the quantity and the final um, uh, dollar amounts. Thank you. There's a question also about what constitutes an established local women's commission. What does that mean? You have to be a women's commission that has been um, introduced um, uh, with the city or the county for which you operate. So you are a part of that county entity, department, unit, agency, however that local jurisdiction is structured. Darcy, you feel free to add on if you have other thoughts there to be more descriptive. Sure, no, I mean, I, th I think the kicker there is just to make sure that it is an, a, a governmental commission as uh, and not sort of a, a separate entity that doesn't work with the local government. Um, so I think the, uh, sorry, there's multiple questions here. There, there's definitely one on indirect cost and what percentage is allowed. Holly, do you want to just rattle that off so we've got it for everybody? Right. 10% is the cap on the indirect cost rate, unless you have a negotiated higher indirect cost rate with the state of California. Perfect. And then another really good question uh, for programs that have nationwide reach, do the funds need to exclusively be used to support only California programming? Yes, it, the funds are intended to support women and girls in California. Your organization um, can be housed outside of California. This question has come up. For example, they're in a neighboring state, but their services are all over the place, but they're the funds they receive from this particular grant will be dedicated towards their California footprint. So the work happening on the ground for women and girls in California. And how does that apply to uh, if these funds are being used to hire, do employees then have to live in California if they're virtual? If they're virtual, it really depends on their um, scope of work. If they are specifically supporting the California programming, if they're a hundred, if they're a full-time employee and they are serving other uh, programming or beneficiaries in other states, I would not expect to see 100% of their salary dedicated to the California program. So really it has to be related to the services and delivery um, of their proposed activities as it relates to the California beneficiary of women and girls. Okay, and then uh, we are getting more questions about applying for multiple programs. How many applications? One application, two programs, two applications, one per program. What's the preference? Uh, for each applying entity, one application. You can have multiple programs in that application across number of funding categories. My example that I will use um, is I am a, a, a in-home health support service and I deliver um, groceries and that's one program. It's our you know food program and then I also do a child care program. I can have you know three funding categories with funds split across those programs, but only one application should come through. Um, let's see. So there are, 
Should someone uh, include information about the needs of the community, history, and purpose of the organization uh, if they are not applying in the capacity building section? Should that go into every application? And that's a great point. Um, we recognize that that is really emphasized in the capacity building since this, or that's the area where you are proposing why you need additional support to grow the, you know, the effectiveness and the ability of your organization to do more. Um, it is not emphasized in the other areas, but I would offer, it would not hurt for us to understand that about your organization. Primarily because this is a brand new grant program. Um, we do not have a history or track record with any grantees um, as a new uh, you know, program of the commission. So the more we learn about you and your experience, effectiveness, and why we should fund you to do this work, um, we'll be better off. You will be more competitive if you provide that addition, you know, that supporting information in your proposal. Uh, another question we have is, can the funds be used to provide direct services statewide or do specific counties need to be listed? And Holly, I'm sorry, I just answered that one in the chat. I think that's to um, Pooja to make sure that there's a list of the counties. Please go ahead and list the direct counties. I know a lot of you guys are asking, can we just kind of do this all encompassing overall work? We're going to support, you know, YOLO. But if you've got several counties, please list those out so that way we can be sure to know exactly um, which county which you intend to support so that the more information you provide us, the better. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Um, there's lots of questions about regranting. Yes, regranting is allowable. Just make sure that you hit the regranting box, that that is one of the buckets that you are applying in. Um, and one regular question is for regranting, would scholarships qualify? Um, yeah. Or Polly. <laughs> Tiffany, why don't you go? This is your expertise area. I'm so sorry. Can you ask the question again? I was answering a question in the chat. Go ahead, Darcy. I'm sorry. Okay. Would scholarships qualify under the regranting category? Scholarships would apply, yes. Um, and please list the scope of what that scholarship is, if you if you will, because oftentimes you see scholarships that give like very minimal information on what it intends to do and serve and who's going to be the recipient. So please list all of that information for me. Thank you. Um, we have a few questions about cost sheets and sort of what falls under supplies or materials. Program software would fall under materials, yes? Yeah, operation, operating expenses. Operating costs. Um, there's some questions about consultant services and what that means and if we can define that a little better. Sure, I'll take a stab at it and my team, please chime in where you feel you need to add more. Um, we There is a section in the cost sheet where you can identify um, consultants. Um, and so we want to ensure that you identify, you know, this particular area. I recognize that you may not know who that is yet and we'll need to run your either your own vetting process to secure that. So it is acceptable to just list we will be bringing in, um, you know, a professional consultant services for program design or, or whatever it is that you're you're needing and seeking, and the estimated amount for which you anticipate for that contract. And Holly, I just wanted to add to that, um, just so you guys know, for for the consulting um, services, just make sure you have any type of provision or expertise, or you, it's expertise or strategic advice that's going to be presented and any decision-making. So let me just be clear and I'll make sure this goes in the FAQs. For any consulting services, they must be able to provide um, expertise, some strategic advice, um, and whatever their decision-making abilities are. Please make sure we have those three and I will make sure those both go in the FAQ for consulting services. Great question. That's great. And we're also getting asked where the cost sheet is located. Cost sheet is a very last page of the downloaded application. So um, scroll to the very end, you will see the cost sheet. And we're asking that you use the format, not recreating your own. You can copy and paste it into multiple pages if you have multiple cost sheets. And 
yeah, good luck with that. One question is about this rolling deadlines. I want to be clear that so far right now we are hoping for rolling deadlines, but we can't guarantee that, right? Right. So if, if you're, if the question is about how I mentioned, this is a rolling grant program, what future grant opportunities there will be. Um, we, unless you have been extended uh, or granted an extension, the deadline is February 4th. Future grant opportunities will follow a very similar format where we will announce the grant funding opportunity for which you can apply. Um, uh, there, it won't be hidden. It'll be made transparent, open, and available. So you're not missing anything um, of a rolling deadline that maybe you don't know about. The only extension we have for people are those who request it. And to clarify, your extension is going to be granted specifically if you are an entity that it requires authorization from a, a city or county or local government in order for you to be um, to be allowed to apply. So those are the um, extension requirements that we are considering with each individual request. Um, and again, future applications um, for grants that we will have, which can happen between now and June of 2022 is really the um, timeline that we are looking at and we will be notifying that publicly. Right. Um, let's see, travel costs are acceptable. So yes to that one, just to take that off. Indirect cap at 10% for each category or for the entire amount? The entire budget. So it has to be 10% of your budget. 10% like it cannot exceed 10% of your entire, of your full, proposal request. Great. Um, to the person who asked if you should send back the entire application, yes, please. It just makes it easier for us to manage. Uh, there's lots of questions about like very specific possibilities for funding. So just a couple are, um, can we pay for interns? Uh, or can we fund an internship program in which we pay our interns? Uh, also in that sort of bucket would be, is there a list of allowable expenses currently not at the moment, right? Um, and then I think the last one is uh, mutual aid is, is under like direct granting, granting direct funds to individuals, if that's allowable. Yes, I will try to tick through those. Okay, so mutual aid, direct grants. Yes, please check direct granting because that is uh, how we define you are delivering a service that your organization is responsible for and providing that directly. So itemize that under direct granting. Um, the, uh, the allowable expenses, we will be providing that to grantees that are being considered for funding. Um, when we schedule your interview and your time, we will uh, go through your budget in greater detail to clarify any questions or concerns that might be flagged as part of your proposal. Um, Darcy, I don't remember the other few, so. Oh, that's okay. That's um, as much as I got. would cover an intern program. That's but, similar to like a scholarship or you would see, you would, I would recommend you put that under capacity building. Um, because you're growing your organization's, um, you know, personnel, including interns, if they are paid or stipended. So I'd have that in your um, capacity building proposal, budget narrative, and cost sheet. Uh, can line items within the budget be modified during the grant period? We um, anticipate not everything is going to go down to the down to this specific dollar and cent. Um, we are going to offer um, some guidance and instructions for any revised budget proposals. Um, and I will say revised within some percentage range, like if it's under um, a 20% and, and this still has to be approved um, by our commission. But for example, if it's a less than 20% change within the categories, you don't need to submit a budget revision. Um, if it's higher than that, then we'll have a process for that, um, for which we can talk through what those adjustments are and, and submit a revised budget. But um, honestly, that's not something that um, needs to be worried about at this point, but we will 
um, provide that direction to funded grantees. Um, one of the questions that came up was around the language about needing to have a connection with, with the local government that I think that's referring to the language specifically around starting a new commission uh, and that, that those funds are for specifically the government entities that have the legal ability to start those commissions. We realize it takes a lot of advocacy work and a lot of uh, folks on the ground pushing them to do so, but for it to be uh, a, a county or a city commission, the county or the city needs to get it off the ground. So that is who needs to apply for the funding. And shout at me in the chat if that's not what you meant. <laughs> um, let's see, Holly, do we have a sense of percentage of applications that we anticipate funding or specific numbers of awards per category? We really do not, and I'm not trying to hide anything, um, but it really just depends on the need out there and what you all are asking for money. And, you know, I think in, in previous grant programs that I know I have professionally been involved with, there tends to be like trends that you see over the years of your grant program and knowing this is our very first one, it's really going to be interesting to see kind of what the proposals come in at, what you guys are saying the needs are. Um, and so, you know, like I said, we have 5 million um, to fund across these five categories. Um, and, you know, we will see uh, what comes in by the deadline of the fourth. Great. Um, and then, Becky, uh, can you, um, Susan looks like she's asking this question a couple of times. So I just want to make sure we capture her. I think Holly, she, she's trying to figure out do we need to list the name of the grant program awarded? Um, do we not list the funders? You know, are we not listing funders, but we're listing our programs that have been funded? That was literally my next question. Okay. <laughs> Just getting to it. I don't want to like direct message you, Susan, so we'll get this cleared up. So is the question whether you list the funder or the grant program being funded? Is that the distinction? That's the question. Which one? We want to know who your funder is, where, where you're getting the money from. And, you know, there is space you could write and I'm making this up, Packard Foundation for our Women and Girls Commission. I'm making that up, but again, that could be an example, but really it's emphasized on who have been your funders over the last five years, if you've had them. Um, and then the question, there needs to be a cost sheet for each category, correct? Correct. Great. Uh, another question about allocating stipends for individuals who are supporting program activities. I don't understand yeah. if that means salary or volunteer stipends or what specifically that might be, but it, it would all sort of fall into the same bucket, right? Uh, yeah, so again, I, go oh, go ahead, Tiffany. No, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, so I was I, just gonna I, read. <laughs> great minds think alike. Um, I'll just quickly say, and I know a lot of you guys have also hit this question a lot on the stipends. I think it just depends on what you're providing the stipend for. A lot of you guys have things that are specific. So, you know, please send those into our grant email so I can address that to you specifically because you guys all have a, such a different touch on what you're going to be providing a stipend for. And I know some of that may not be allowable, but I want to take a look at what that circumstances is so I also can update the FAQ for everyone so they're very clear on what the stipend um, when you're giving up this stipend, what is that supposed to be used for? So I will, I will clear that up, but Holly, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was gonna just reinforce my previous answer about if it's for individuals that are, um, you know, whether they're volunteering or interning or um, part-time or limited term staff you're bringing on board, reflect that it, that is very clearly capacity building activity. Um, that you can have reflected, you know, in, in that budget, as well as direct service, right? You're, you're in order, if, like Tiffany said, depending on what the stipends are being used for, if they're being used to actually provide a, uh, a service, um, you know, it's good to know that distinction. So the more clear you can be in your budget proposal, that will help us understand more um, about what, what is allowable and not allowable in your proposal. I have multiple, multiple questions from somebody who clearly fills out forms like I do, uh, trying to figure out what lines to list cities or counties on. 
So uh, on the form, can you list all the cities under one county on the same line? Yeah, just get it in there. We'll see it. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Um, if you're going to serve the whole county, do you also need to break out the specific cities? Um, if the whole county is being served, there's no need to do that. If you're only serving specific cities within the county, tell us which cities. I, I hope that was super clear. Um, and then there's one more, let's see. Um, <laughs> yes, list the organizations who have provided grants over the past five years. Uh, do you also want to know the amount and the exact year received, Holly? No, that's not required. Right, okay. All righty. Uh, should cost sheets be reflective of the entire program budget or just the amount being requested from the commission? Just the amount requested for the commission. So it does not need to reflect the entire program cost. Just what you're asking for in terms of resources from the commission for that funding category. Okay. And there are about 14 new ones in the chat I haven't pulled out yet. So give me one second here. Okay. Well, I she's know. pulling. Oh, go ahead, go Tiffany. Go ahead. I was just going to say, because we have four minutes left while Darcy is pulling out those final questions. I am going to run a poll just to hear from you all about whether or not you're still planning or have or will or decided not to apply and how we're doing in terms of training. So I'm going to leave this up for just a few minutes. And uh, Darcy, go ahead and ask any remaining questions you have in the last three minutes. Sure, will do. Okay, so next one is asked and answered. Um, also answered. Sorry, Tiffany was getting ahead of me on some of these, so some of these she's already gotten a handle on. Uh, let's see. Does the fiscal sponsor have to list grants awarded only to the sponsored? organization or does it need to list all grants awarded to the fiscal sponsor which would include for lots of other organizations just the organization um, that is being fiscally response fiscally sponsored so fiscal agent applies on behalf of uh, a food bank of sacramento only the food bank of sacramento's past grants for the last five years should be listed not all the other agencies that the fiscal sponsor is serving. Hey, Holly, can you put up the um, poll? It looks like a, someone or a few people can't see the poll. Oh, okay. So we want to make sure you guys take some time to answer the questions. I, I'm, I'm, I see you guys send them in the chat. So we'll go ahead and put that up and leave it up for a little bit. It'd be helpful to see how this training is for you all. Um, okay. And then uh, also, Elsa, I think you're asking, can we we can we reapply or apply again if we're not funded this round? So, Holly, people can reapply if they're not eligible this time or something comes up. And I think again to that question of people trying to get their um, 501 status, if you're in the process of it and it doesn't meet the deadline, you need to be active and eligible at the time that you apply for this, not any time after the fourth. Um, so please, we will have this another opportunity and feel free to monitor and watch our website for the opportunity to come up again. So you're not just out and this was your last chance. Please don't feel that way. So we'll have more opportunity for you. Um, I will, there's yeah. one I really want to make sure we get to really fast, um, which is the supplemental materials. These are put in there. Uh, you'll see when you go on the website that you have the option of giving us supplemental materials. These are an extra. They are not scored with your application. It is just a way that you can visually sort of uh, help explain a little better what program you're funding. This is, you know, a one pager or a brochure. It's uh, It's got a pretty tight size limit. So don't send us your annual report. It won't accept it. Um, but, you know, a flyer, something that just shows a little bit about any program that might exist that you want to give us, uh, just to give us more of a sense of what it is that you're asking for funding for. Again, these are not scored on the rubric. They are an, an, a, they're in addition. Um, I would also ask uh, that, <laughs> let's see, what was the, oh, one more. Can funding, Holly, if you could get at this one, can funding be used to lease or rent space? that will be used to provide direct services? Yes, 
I think so long as you make the direct correlation why this space is critical to your service delivery and be sure to have it reflected in the budget. Um, and I would also say that um, it, it relate the cost of that rental or that monthly fee associated with the percentage of time used for that service delivery. For example, if you're running 25 programs out of that building and we're only funding one of them, I wouldn't expect to see 100% of that rental cost covered by the commission. That's just a very simple example or way to look at it. Um, give us details, uh, you know, explain it as thoroughly as you can so we have a good picture. Um, and with that, I am seeing about 60% of you hitting the poll. Um, I'll give you one last little shout out. We want to hear from everybody if you're going to play or not. Molly, I got one last question I really want okay. to get to before we close it down because it's sure. come up more than once, and that's about new nonprofits applying for funding who don't have a history of having been funded. Please go ahead and apply. Correct. Yes. Tell it, let, make your case for what you do that nobody else does, which is why you exist, and let us know how we can help you. Great. Okay, well, with that, I'm going to end the poll. Thank you guys so much for giving us that feedback. So many of you are still planning on applying, um, a little bit undecided. Um, I'm glad that we were able to have this before the deadline. I hope it's helpful um, as you build your application. Um, I'm so excited uh, to continue to see what you guys are suggesting and proposing to help uh, improve the lives of women and girls. Um, again, grants at women.ca.gov for any remaining questions. Um, best of luck to each and every one of you. And the next time we speak, we'll hopefully um, have some exciting news about your proposal to share. So thank you all. Have a great rest of your afternoon and take care. Thanks, everybody. Bye,